Hello, good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to listeners all around the world. Welcome to the fifth episode of the Discord Chat. I'm Tony, your host for this evening. Unfortunately, Dan can't join us tonight. Don't worry, he's fine, but he's currently staying in a region with very poor internet where he can't really stream. So regretfully, he's asked me to stand in. Today, I will be asking your questions to our distinguished guest. Joining me tonight, the one and only, you guessed it, Lorne Lanning, Chief Creative Officer and Co-Founder at Oddworld Inhabitants. Welcome to the show, Lorne, and how are you doing? Thanks for having me, Tony. I'm doing great, and uh, thanks for standing in to Dan today. I really appreciate it. Well, it's my pleasure. Really, it is. Excellent. So, um, as per usual, uh, we are broadcasting live, uh, eventually, on Riverside.fm and on our YouTube channel. So, welcome to all of you joining us there, and thank you for your patience. And also, as per usual, uh, the edited version of this podcast will be available in a few days. So, today's theme is the wildlife of Oddworld. Um, Clearly, this was an especially intriguing topic for the community, since we've got lots and lots of questions today. More questions than on any of our previous podcasts. Lorne, uh, we have about 50 minutes. Do you think we can manage all of these in that time? I'll do my best. I, th I think we can. I think we can too. Brilliant. So, without further ado, let's crack on. I've popped the questions into loose categories, and our, our first batch of questions are related to, uh, directly or more loosely, scrabs and paramites. The first question today is from a user called Tactical Isopod, and they ask, Are there subspecies and or regional variations of scrabs and paramites in the same way there are animals in our world? Good question, and that answer is definitely. So different territories, depending on geography, uh, geographical location, weather, climate, etc., would, um, you know, through their evolutionary tree, have uh, developed into different traits and eventually altogether different species originating out of those, depending on how far we go back in the tree of the genus. Fabulous. And then that leads me directly on to the second question by She Hannessy. Are the scrabs and paramites so sacred and or wild that they aren't tamed um, or tameable? Um, it would be rad to see some symbiosis between the muds and scrabs or paramites. For example, uh, paramite hound hunting or scrab riding. You know, funny, funny uh, you should mention. So, so the answer in the big meta question is... We've been told, this is my, my personal philosophy, is we've been told that many species are untamable. And uh, the number one, I, I think, would be up there is uh, polar bears, right? Mm -hmm. But then with sentient animals, I guess, you know, warm-blooded in particular, there's a connection that can take place if uh, some extreme set of circumstances can really rock the boat of inherited instinctual behavior. So there is a man who's formed an incredible relationship with a polar bear, a fully grown polar bear. And I remember when we used to uh, be building theme park attractions, uh, Sherry, uh, my partner, was big in uh, designing theme park rides, or I should say producing theme park rides that were film rides, or they called them ride films, motion bases and films synchronized together, like uh, Back to the Future, which was one of the ones she helped produce. Uh, actually, she produced the whole thing, sorry. But the point there is that there's a little story here where a whole group of people, <laughs> this has probably never been public, but screw it, presented a ride attraction that featured a trained polar bear. And they presented this to one of the titans of uh, Universal Studios, who was in charge of that. And the fatal mistake they made, he pointed out in one second, which is <laughs> he listened to the whole pitch and then he went, you don't train 
polar bears. <laughs> right? So there's lots of dancing bears and trained bears around the world, but not polar bears. However, if you look at, you know, a man rescued a, a, a cub. Yeah, I think its mother was killed. I don't remember how. And he nurtured it up. And he was, I guess, a hard enough guy, meaning, meaning, you know, they could be gently playing with you and accidentally bite off your hand, right? So yeah. somehow he was hard enough to endure the relationship where this guy has a relationship with his polar bear, you know, is like you would expect people to have with their dog. So it's pretty amazing. And so my viewpoint was always, um, I had another, another view on this too. So this is one of those questions I'll elaborate a little more on. When I was a, a kid, I would be told that, you know, when we were taught in school, like this is how certain animals are and you're not really going to change that. And if you listen to anthropologists and biologists that were in the field, you know, looking at animals or, you know, um, scientists, th they'd say, you know, and, and you never get in the way. Like you never stop something else from eating or something like that, you know, because you might have a human take on it. I had a slightly different take, which is if something asks you for help, and we see this all the time. We see it with seals jumping on boats, jumping on surfboards, trying to ev evade uh, sharks and killer whales. Um, we see it with a lot of mammals in the sea. We see it with mammals who will come out. Elephants will come and ask for help. Wild elephants will ask for help about one of their calves that's in trouble, fell in a hole. There's lots of cases where I think on video on YouTube, you can just search, you know, animals asking for help. And my feeling was always, if something's asking you for help, then help it. You don't be like, oh, you're a species and you're just part of the food chain. And I'm just going to watch you die today. I'll be like, you ask for help. Like someone on the street, a victim of a crime or something like that. We, we don't have to help. But if something asks you for help and animals just do it, you know, they're not using the words, of course. But, but you can tell, you know, and I've been asked for help by animals when it just seems like um, there was a raccoon one time and it had its head stuck in a peanut butter jar. And it just seemed like it was following us, like asking us for help. And then when we pulled it off, you know, it didn't, it didn't freak out. It was kind of, that's what it was hoping for. And you can see lots of cases like that. So for me, the idea that something's untrainable, it's a construct that we made up, but it's not necessarily the law of nature, right? It's just an assumption of nature. But I feel like we have this interconnected, you know, I'm going back to the Yodaism of it all, right? We have this interconnected relationship that if we are able to demonstrate a connection with almost anything, then almost anything is possible. There's a girl who swims with sharks. I think her Instagram is called Ocean Ramsey. And a lot of you have probably seen her, but this girl, you're just wondering why she hasn't been eaten already. Because she will swim with the biggest great whites in the world. Like literally Big Blue she was swimming with. I, th I think it's called Big Blue, which is like one of the biggest recorded 23-foot great whites in the world. And she has a way of understanding them that she's never been attacked. And she's always with the biggest sharks. And there's something about that. So knowledge of species and compassion and empathy and treating them more like how, uh, what's her name with the uh, gorillas, sorry. And the apes was uh, oh uh, Diane Fossey. No, not that. Well, she was she was there too. But I was thinking of uh, the original, who uh, her name is slipping me out the way. I can't believe, but it's early my time, so forgive me. But uh, you know, she just had a different take on wildlife, and I think people that study wildlife as a relationship and not as a science learn more about the species from behavior. And you can't learn that when it's in a lab, when it's in a cage, when it, you have to see what it's like in its natural environment. So anyway, a long winded answer to that question, which I actually love. And so in that, if they're tameable, I, I wanted to look for, I'll find it through the course, the course of this structure uh, of this conversation. But um, we had outlaws on, on scraps when we were working on, uh, when we were hoping to do a film a while ago. And it was really cool when Raymond Swanland did a couple of paintings of uh, kind of a scrap pack without laws on them. You know, we can get more into that. But yeah, so those things would be possible. It would just take some extraordinary understanding to achieve it. And one other case I would point to is uh, I think they're called the hyena men of Nigeria. People that are using hyenas and baboons in like street performing stuff to, you know, get money. But it's kind of amazing because you never would have thought a baboon or a hyena would ever even put up with that, right? <laughs> they just seem so terrifying. So anyway, that's a, a cap off the question with that. I think animals are extraordinary and our connection with them can be more extraordinary. 
Well, I, I definitely agree with that. I think it was, was it Jane Goodall that we get you referring to? Jane Goodall, earlier? that's it, that's it. Yeah, uh, yeah. I knew, I knew the name was on the tip of my tongue. Fabulous answer. Thank you. You bet. Moving on to the next question here on Paramites and Scrabs. Jaken asks, will the next episode have Scrabs and Paramites again? I missed running away from them in Soulstorm. I, I can't know at this point in time. Uh, and I don't mean to be brief on that, but honestly, I, I, I can't really know. Like I could design a project that has it in it and then figure out once we have a final budget, you know, everything has to fit in a budget. So I hesitate to make any commitments like that, but I hope so. I love them. I'd like to see them in a different territory personally. You know, like what is the leopard scraps like? What are the panther paramites like? You know, the, these things I'm really curious about. The slight deviations in their DNA through time. A lot of fun to be had there. So the, the answer, Jacon, is uh, maybe and hopefully. Mm -hmm. And next question from Oddball. Is it possible to ride a paramite? So I would put that in the same class. It would be a very unique thing, a very unique thing, but it's not completely out of question because they are warm-blooded. Mm -hmm. Well, another that's quite specific question from Mudos Explorer. Um, do paramites have queens? And if so, where do they live? They don't. But to shed a little light on that, there's only one known mammal. That, there's a super species. That's the mole rat, to the best of my really? knowledge which is just completely baffling. I mean, so complex, so interesting. And that was uh, a big part of the inspiration of the original idea. When I learned that super species could be mammalian, then I was like, whoa, this is an interesting opportunity. But the really interesting opportunity, I thought, was around, let's say, first of all, I think more interesting drama and content is derived out of dysfunctional relationships, right? Like no one really wants to watch a movie about everyone's perfect relationship. Right? No, that's, that movie's not making any money, right? So dysfunctionality is, it's engaging. And I think this is why reality TV shows were really engaging to a lot of people is because it's kind of like the zombie genre. What do ordinary people do in extraordinary circumstances? How do they rise to the occasion or, or flounder or you know, get killed off? Like whatever, whatever may happen there. So when we look at universe building, you know, world building and soil for rich narrative to come out of, I look for dysfunctional possibilities and how you can really enhance an idea by finding a way to scale it. In the relationships of most of, we'll call them the modern societies, the people living in a civilization, not the rats and things like that that also live there, the, the pigeons, you know, but the, the people that are functioning in a civilization, and the Mudokans would be included in that, you know, or, or we should say the industrialized Mudokans would be included in that. When, when we say they had queens, it gives us a really unique opportunity to play up parental relationships and in some respects to reduce or enhance uh, empathy connection between those relationships. So it's kind of like, you know, the old mother in the shoe, right? She had so many kids she didn't want to do, but it wasn't like she was blaming it on the kids. So it was, it was kind of an interesting fable to play off of someone in an extreme condition. And that's what really grabbed me about the idea of, of super species as mammals, basically. And um, what then happens with those conditions when all the variables of the so-called free market come into play. So when, you know, the offspring has a different value than what it originally had in sort of the evolutionary, more natural scheme of things, and now it's industrialized. And I like that backdrop because it really allows us to play off of those themes and play up the dysfunctionality to really get a little more human than human, <laughs> as, as Blade Runner said. So I hope that helps. Really? Yeah. Yes. There's such a breadth of things to explore there. I mean, it's almost a whole episode in itself on that sort of topic. The last question I've got in terms of um, paramites and scraps is from Vanya. Now, uh, there isn't a most committed fan award on this uh, podcast, unfortunately, but I feel Vanya might win it with this one. Okay. The question goes, I've always loved the Scrabs and Paramites, so much so I've got tattoos on my shoulders of their symbols. But I've always been curious, as dangerous as these creatures are, 
How was Rupture Farms able to keep them all contained, especially paramites, what with all their webs and such? You know, we've, we've wanted to a few different times show how mass capturing and then mass containment of these animals worked, especially the more dangerous ones. And some of the examples that I've seen in life go to like crocodile farms, where um, you're like, you gotta be kidding me. <laughs> yeah, like I was, I was at one in Singapore one time and you could just tell if, if it was in the United States, there would have been so many rows of fences and security and signs saying, you know, don't be a complete idiot and stick your hand in there or jump in the case. But but in Singapore, <laughs> it was like, man, it was so many ways you could just stupidly fall into these pens with all these crocodiles. I mean, lots of crocodiles. And uh, being in Gator World down in Florida, if you ever get a chance in Orlando, to me, that's way better than Disneyland is go to Gator World. And it's just you walk out on these decks that go out over the swamps and there is some monster alligators in there. So there's ways to contain the hostile animals. They just have to be done different. And I'm not saying, you know, I promote that, but it's definitely capable. And we even saw a whale prison that was uh, photographed, found on Google Earth by, uh, I think it was biologists looking for you know, crimes against nature. And they found that there was a whole like whale, caged whales that were in a bay or a river, you know, somewhere. Uh, deep, and I believe it was Russia. And so that was discovered, you know, and it was like, what are they using these for? And it looked like they were selling them to uh, aquariums around the world. But even a whale can be kept in captivity. Uh, in the aquarium level, I think great whites are one of the few that doesn't last in captivity. So it's possible, and then it would just be more extreme measures. And even in Oddworld, you know, in the games that we've released so far, we've only got to touch on a few views of, oh, there's paramites on conveyor belts or scrabs and this and that or in cages. But we never really got to um, go into the depth of how that might work. Like I would have loved, and I hope someday, you know, through a linear series or whatever, that we're able to really go into the life in the farm. And then just watching, you know, people's daily routine would shine so much light on these types of questions where, you know, we could see exactly how dangerous they are, like people who work in crocodile farms, and then uh, how stupid people can be around dangerous animals, which is yeah. you know, they're ready for tons of comedy relief, dark comedy relief. But um, I hope that sheds light on that question. So I think they're extremely dangerous, but they can be contained. Excellent. Excellent. Yes, there are there are very many series on that you can view on YouTube, for examples of of uh, people being careless around uh, wild animals, and and it also ties back into what you were saying earlier about uh, typical or, or boring situations, not making very good stories. Mm -hmm. It's like the the show Jackass, right? Is for males around the world. Um, there's nothing more hilarious than watching another man suffer pain out of his own willingness to do something stupid for the entertainment of the rest of us. Like there's, <laughs> there's something that really resonates yeah. deep in our core, <laughs> that, you know? And, uh, uh, <laughs> my niece and I always try to watch Jackass or wild boys was great in that way. You're like, how could you do something so insane? But I need to watch it. <laughs> you know, and maybe you'll get eaten this time. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. So, Sorry, I lost track on that one. I yes, I, no, because I, I went off script, didn't I? Let's, okay, I, okay, I will bring you. myself back around. Um, our next uh, little uh, subcluster of questions is uh, a bit more loose. It's mixed fauna. The next question is from Game Boy Adventurer. Which fuzzles can speak? The ones in Munch's Odyssey mostly speak in gibberish, only that Munch can understand. And in Stranger's Wrath, they all appear unable to speak at all. Is it that West Mudos fuzzles aren't as smart or articulate as the ones in East Mudos? Or are the Stranger's Wrath fuzzles speaking in a language the other species can't understand? A, a great question. And the answer is that Munch's adapt Munch's, he was fixed with technology. And so his head head support, which allowed him zapper, which allowed him the inner, the, the uh, nodule on his head, the port on his head, it opened up some other abilities. So he's able to understand the, the fuzzles. So because of his technology that was implanted, you know, that the Vikers were researching this and that, but because of that, it gave him some abilities that they weren't expecting. And that allowed him to sort of unify the fuzzles on his behalf for all of their behalf, really. So that's where Stranger is not outfitted with that tech. And along that front is one of the most wonderful comic books that 
I never forgot. And uh, it was a graphic novel, but it was called We Three. I'm just curious, you know, anybody know We Three? And it was about three animals, a cat, a dog, and a bunny rabbit that were in a military research, like a DARPA type of facility. And they were wiring them as weapons, but they were able to start communicating with each other. I just love that story. I hope someone makes a movie of that someday or something. I think it was just really powerful. Kind of like a more modern watership down. <laughs> yes. If you remember that. Oh, yeah. Have you seen the animated film of that? Yeah, I loved it. I loved it. I had to read it in school. And then when I saw it, it was like, but it was pretty, you know, it was, it was not a totally uplifting story, right? Not at all. It was very, I mean, talking, uh, dovetailing into other things you said in terms of uh, making innocence and dark themes work together. It's really, uh, I think it's Richard Adams that wrote it, isn't he? And I love the book too. It's a really fabulous story. Um, yeah, I'm amazed they made it as an animated story. Yeah. And and with some really great actors in it as well, like John Gilgood and John Hurt and all, all these. It was a really strange combination, um, but worked so well. Yeah, yeah. The other one that was kind of close, and it was Disney, and it was surprisingly intense too, was um, with the mice in the, in the bush. What was that called? Uh, the Rats of Nim? The Secret of Nim. And for Disney, it was kind of su surprising, you know, I thought. It was an old one, but it was a good one. Oh, well, I'm going to check it out. Game Boy Adventure, I hope that answered your question. And thank you, Lorne. For those just tuning in, I am your stand-in host today. I'm Tony. Don't worry, Dan is all in one piece. He's just uh, in an area where he doesn't have very good internet, so he asked me to stand in today. Right, moving on to our next question. This is from uh, She Hannessy, and it is, Will we ever see more subspecies of our favourites, i.e. slogs and slegs, um, or slog and sleg? I recently drew a slog subspecies for fun, and the community seemed to like it. Uh, could we have a trash crocodile slog maybe there's lots of possibilities so if we haven't seen it yet we we just look at it like how would biology actually work if you know this was a planet with a big history and models similar largely similar to our own in terms of how things uh, have evolutionary trees what's the possibilities and really every different climate every different shipping route um, invasive species there's all kinds of possibilities about how things would have been moved around and then occasionally you find you know, the ligers, right? The mm. things that no one thought would be able to breed. You ever seen a liger? Well, yeah. I think they mentioned that in Napoleon Dynamite, <sighs> the ligers. But those are terrifying. You know, tiger lion mix. Oh, yeah. They, and they get bigger than either. <laughs> I know. It's like, whoa. You get Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger tigers which is, <laughs> and lions, which is terrifying. So there's all kinds of those possibilities, definitely, just like pyramids and scraps, wide range of possibilities. Fantastic. Right. This question is from Keep On Keeping On about the rats in Munch's Odyssey. Are they a common sight on Oddworld? Um, also, can they be kept as pets? So the, the answer there is there, there would be a common sight. We always wanted more of these in rupture farms. And then it just came down to, you know, how much performance do we have and what's important and, you know, all of that. There was something that we wanted to add in the entire time was cockroaches and rats, because those are always around food processing plants, always around slaughterhouses, you know, even small farms, right? Uh, I watch videos sometimes of the uh, terriers uh, being let loose on farm rats in the UK, which is just like, wow, these, these guys would kill hundreds of rats in a day, right? Just five yeah. dogs or something. It's crazy. So uh, we always wanted to show a lot more of them. But you'll find them in greater density when you're in cities. And so then you would have, you know, some people would have pets of, of those things, but it would likely be illegal because they'd say, oh, well, these are virus carrying, bacteria carrying, disease carrying. And probably a lot of them would be. So um, some people would definitely have them for pets or some individuals would because you can always develop that special relationship. There was a moment when I was in uh, one of the, like really trying periods in my life. And I was working in Brooklyn, New York, and it was just having like a really, really shitty kind of week and didn't feel like I had enough money to pay rent. And all those kinds of things were just weighing heavy on me. And I was in this terrible loft on like fifth story, <laughs> a hot, sweaty building. And underneath on lower floors, it was actually sweatshops of uh, crazy stuff. And uh, I was in the bathroom one day. I was just, it was just all so grim. 
And then I hear this scratching. And it was inside the bathtub that was next to where I was sitting, right, without getting into too much detail. And I'm hearing the scratch, and I look in, and I saw this mouse. And it was a mouse, and he was trying to get out of the bathtub. And it wasn't my place, right? I was just working there. And I just felt like that mouse at that moment. I oh. felt like that mouse in New York, you know, where when you watch something like a mouse trying to get out of a porcelain bathtub, then it doesn't stand a chance because it can't get a grip anywhere. So it's just trying to rise and it keeps on falling back down. And that's exactly how I felt. So I stuck a broom handle into the tub. And as soon as I stuck it in there, the mouse just ran it like it knew. I can't say what it was thinking, but it seemed to know that I was helping it get out. And it just, it ran up that broomstick and right past my arm with no fear. And then he just uh, took off and went wherever he was going. And I didn't care if it was my house. I would have tried to catch him. But here I didn't care. I was like, be free. You know, good luck out there. <laughs> Tying directly into what you were saying earlier about all animals being able to communicate for help and things possibly. That's right. So there's always that possible connection. You know, for me, it was a mouse in a tub. Great answer. Thank you, Lorne. Moving on, question from Wickus. What kind of birds form the bird portals seen in the Odd World games? You know, there's something else we've always wanted to get closer to the details of and just been one of those things that hasn't happened. But uh, we think of them as doves, you know, like the white dove, right, that the UN would have on its flag or some of its flags have a white dove. But the dove is often seen as a figure of peace. Now, the hilarious thing about doves is this is the irony. I just love irony, right? So our symbol for peace globally oftentimes is this white dove. And then if we think something's horrific, you know, oftentimes that's really dangerous, like the wolf, right? But what isn't commonly known is the white doves, when they're being territorial, they'll peck each other to death. They'll find a bloody white dove somewhere. It's a possibility that another dove or a series of doves took it out. So doves are actually brutal to each other, whereas wolves don't kill each other. Right. So you have the dove that's a sign of peace and they'll like bloody each other to death through horrible pecking. And then you have the wolves that are a sign of danger. And a lot of things I'm not trying to summarize at all, but, you know, kind of very dangerous animal, certainly not associated with peace, but they'll never kill their own. So which one's kind of more <laughs> warlike, you know, to its own people, yeah. its own races, doves are. So the, that kind of irony was like, OK, they're, they're a double edge, right? They have something wonderful about them and then they have something dangerous about them. And that's no exception for the birds around the portals. They have a connection. They have a connection to the Mudakins, and it would be to the shaman class because they had relations with them through time. A lot of that would be inspired by indigenous of the outback, the Australian Aborigines or Native Americans was a lot of uh, my inspiration for those things, the relationships they have. And today I live in an area that's biggest reservations in the United States are in Arizona. So they're relatively close by. But it's very interesting to see all their uh, art and the relationships to the animals and how they viewed it and what their myths and lore were. So hopefully that's helpful. Absolutely. Absolutely. You just feel like you're scratching the surface with a lot of these things. There's so much in there. But that's why I really enjoy these talks. <laughs> like, oh, good. This is a chance to, you know, reflect on it and, and kind of make a record of it. Absolutely. Um, so, oh, let's keep track of where I am. So we just had the birds question. Okay, next question from Reese G. What is the relationship between Mudokans and Elums? Elums. Elums. It was it was originated out of a uh, mule spelled backwards. Oh. So, yeah, yeah. You have more to the question, so go ahead. Yes. Um, are they loyal to each other? Uh, that is Mudokans and Elums. And do they have other uses besides transportation? I'd say uh, they're – so the, do they have other uses? Yes. Um, beasts of burden, right? So they might be hooked up in different cultures to water wheels and made to walk in circles like we see all over the world. You know, uh, if you don't have rivers, you don't have fuel, you might use animals to turn gears that would then, you know, grind grains or whatever it may be. They've been used through history. I mean, we thought mule because it was kind of – we wanted the stubborn behavior of a mule. You know, when we were playing Apes Odyssey, that came through, right? You had to do things to get them to help you. And mules are kind of hilarious that way. But really, I thought of them more as camels. Like the camels are something that was, uh, I don't know how many wild mules there were before they became mules through through being domesticated. I, I just don't have that answer, right? I'm sure an answer is out there. 
but camels were certainly walking around wild forever. Well, not forever, but, you know, not to get too clinical about it. Yeah. But For quite a long time. Yeah, <laughs> something that was really built for the desert, really built to contain water, and then kind of made a convenient riding, convenient partner if you were cruising across deserts, which, you know, many groups of people, especially herders, still use to this day. They're a lot more efficient than technology out there oftentimes, right? Sand will ruin engines and all kinds of problems. So I, I've kind of seen them more as camels. And then camels, I think, are just as ornery as uh, mules. So <laughs> that's that's the origin. Fabulous. Oh, and uh, are they loyal to each other? Again, like a horse. Uh, sorry, because I didn't answer that part. Like a horse. And I know people who've had severe injuries, you know, wound up in comas from horses. And I often wonder, you know, how, how much of a horse person were they? <laughs> you know, like, I don't know, you know, if you, if you just get on something, I kind of had a rule that I said for a long time, which is if it has teeth bigger than I do, I don't want to ride it. <laughs> and, uh, and so I was always a little intimidated by horses. I saw someone get kicked when I was a kid. I was around a horse. And I was oh. like, wow, I don't, I don't want to mess with a horse. Yeah. But I think, again, it comes back to that relationship. Like there's a behavior of the species and then there can be a, a differentiated behavior of the individual based on the way it was treated, based on the connection that was formed. You know, and it's interesting, like even going through, um, you know, rescuing some dogs and then taking them through some training and stuff. The trainers say the dog needs to know you're a team. He needs to know he's got your back. He needs to know you guys are going to solve problems together. And I was like, huh, I think a lot of that kind of came naturally, but I never really understood that. But then as I applied it more, you could just see it like they really want to feel the connection that you got each other as a pack. And that I think is, uh, you know, kind of fabulous. I love those things. So, mm. so again, it comes down to the individual relationships, just like people. Okay. Like we can form those deeper relationships with animals. We just have to be listening kind of with our heart and really paying attention to all their little gestures. Like I realized my dogs will tell me what they want because they will always look in the direction of what they want if I just watch them long enough, if they're bugging me. And then with time, I can figure out, oh, I've got one that'll just come over and start crying. I realize somewhere in the house, one of her beds, she wants to lay in, but she wants it made first. <laughs> so she figured out if she just comes up and cries at me, I'll, I'll follow her to her bed and make it for her. So it's, it's a question of being tuned in. <laughs> yeah, I guess so, yeah. Lovely. Fabulous answer. And I hope that answers your question, Reese G. A couple of questions which I'll read out together about fleeches and sleeches. First one from Susie. How does a fleech turn into a sleech and do they weave a cocoon and transform that way? Also, a question from Vlam. Could you tell us more about the connection between sleeches and fleeches? We were looking at some of the, the ways that creatures metamorphosize over time. And, you know, if it's the original fleeches, as you saw, they were, you know, felt very alligator-like. And we were like, okay, but what's more the, the caterpillar stage of that? You know, like what's more of that? What did it come out of? And we didn't want to stay too literal with the double heads on each side because we really wanted something that, you know, had to turn around <laughs> right? in, the, in the earlier embryotic sense of it. So it does go into a hibernation state and cocoon and then transforms and then breaks its previous shell. Yes, for a sleech to become a fleech. Now, I just want to say also, we've also considered, hasn't shown up yet, but we've considered in this world, mostly we're familiar with the things that go through a metamorphosis stage once, for the most part. I'm not speaking about like small cellular creatures that are capable of all kinds of regeneration, but mm. so if you go, okay, a caterpillar becomes a moth, what would the moth become if that process kept on going? So we've thought about that and... Sleeches become fleeches, and then fleeches become what? And, and so I'll just leave that open question out there. Oh, great. Yes. Answer a question with a question. I'm sure that was <laughs> that was born a, a lot more questions. Um, we've had sleeches and we've had fleeches. Next questions are about meeches. This one's from uh, Jonah Magi. Are meeches truly extinct, or is this just something the Magog cartel believes? because they can't find any. That's my feeling, is that it's the, what the Magog cartel believes or who the subsidiaries of them, you know, rupture farms and those that are responsible to harvest them. 
So if you just look at like corporate reporting, right, for annual public company filings, things like this, projections, they wouldn't want to admit that there's more out there. They just don't know how to find them. So it's just easier to say, well, this this model, this brand is all done because we've run out of these creatures and there's no more of them. But I always remember the uh, Tasmanian tiger. Are you familiar with that? Yes. And I believe you've mentioned it as well in a previous podcast. It stuck in my mind. And there's, so there's this, something happened to me when I was a kid. And I think I mentioned this as well, when I spotted blue crabs. And then I was at later in an event with my dad. And it was like a, they called them shad bakes. And, and it was like one of those gatherings on a coastal town in Connecticut. And I was trying to tell some people these crabs that I'd seen in this place that I had grown up. You know, and I was still a little kid, but I'd been going, climbing across these rocks in a cove for at least, you know, five, six years already. Never saw these before. I had been down there all the time. Never saw these before. And then there was a marine biologist who happened to just be standing there. And it was like, well, not really. They're not actually blue crabs. He's just mistaking them for it. I was like, bitch, they're blue crabs. <laughs> like, you know, but he was the authority, right? <laughs> so he just didn't know that they had come that far this year. And so here I was, a kid who didn't know anything, but I was a witness to it. And here is the authority who knows it all. And he was 100% wrong. And I never forgot that because I felt a lot that way a lot in science classes, especially if they were talking about animals. Even in, you know, bigger, bigger concepts, theories of the universe, um, Big Bang, a lot of it, I'm like, yeah, maybe. I think there's a much better answer. We just haven't <laughs> discovered it yet. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm not anti-science. I'm more like, oh, no. don't, don't close the book when you don't really understand because you're just using the threshold of where your knowledge is. Absolutely. One of the things you mentioned uh, is uh, Rupert Sheldrake in a previous uh, podcast. That's you. right. I'm a fan of him. I, I always respect people who practice science, but don't put it too much in a box and aren't afraid to admit we don't know A, B, and C. Yeah. I feel like that sometimes gets lost, you know. Yeah. Once knowledge becomes institutionalized, it's prone to protecting its originators. I've walked through the British Museum, and I became, just in, in general in life, there's certain types of ancient bronzes and stuff that I took a, a liking to researching quite deeply. And then I walked through the British Museum, and I just noticed some fakes right away. Right? Just like, these are obvious fakes. Just to speak to museums and fakes, there are way more fakes inside museums than people really want to believe. And some of those are fakes because the original is too delicate. So they just tell you it's the original, it's a perfect copy, but the original is actually in a vault somewhere. You know, there's a lot of that that goes on mm -hmm. for legitimate reasons. But um, there's also preserving the heritage of the institution. So as soon as I saw the fakes, I knew the story. And I'm not claiming I'm psychic or something. I was just like, I'll bet this was donated a few hundred years ago or a hundred years or whatever before a lot of carbon testing, uh, various forms of ways of dating material. And it was from a very wealthy donor and they never wanted to offend them. So it stayed, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like once you understand sort of the commerce of art and the, the, uh, the roles of museums and curators and things like that, you know, they're not going to offend one of their largest donors, especially if it had a high price tag, right? If they say it's phony, all of a sudden someone's uh, seven million dollar tax deduction because they donated it is now invalid. <laughs> like you don't want to, you don't want to create that type of problems for your, you know, the people that donate to the institution, etc. So the world is complicated with human relations, and science is completely tainted that way. Yeah, so-called science. No, I, I think a, a healthy skepticism there is always good, should be encouraged. Yep. And uh, yep. I, I can't say I disagree with anything you, you've touched on there. I think also how, how institutions operate. Yes, we can be naive about it or we can sort of say yes. I, I'm sure you've pretty much hit the nail on the head there. The next question, actually, you've slightly covered, but I'll ask it because I think it takes it in a slightly different direction. It's, it's from uh, Tiny Knight and it's is the idea of Meech's being extinct set in stone, or would there possibly be a chance of a small population of them in a more treacherous part of Mudos where nobody dares to go? All things are possible. So it's always possible, you know, just like touching on the Tasmanian tiger, right? Touching on the coelacanth that was discovered off of Madagascar. We thought they were millions of years old fossils that had been gone forever, and yet somehow they're still swimming around. I can't imagine what's still swimming around the ocean that we haven't found yet. Indeed. You know, there's all types of mysteries down there. But uh, there's two possibilities for bringing things back. There's, we find the species still somehow survived. The other is, it's cloned. 
And then you get into what the vikers are capable of. If a species of viable meat went extinct, you can bet that the vikers would see that as a business opportunity to bring back basically a natural resource for industry, something to harvest. And all they would need to do is develop the patent to have the cloning rights to it. Mm -hmm. And then it could be brought back, just like Jurassic Park. There's a great what if. Very intriguing. <laughs> Lovely. Last question in my loose category called mixed fauna is Lantra. Thank you as always for your inspiring creation of Oddworld and for taking the time to answer these questions. Do the inhabitants of cities and the industrialized races recognize gabbits as sentient, as they do with Modokans? Or do they think of them as quote unquote wildlife like scrabs and paramites? That would be wildlife. Industry doesn't really recognize sentience. Right. It's a fuzzy thing that affects bottom line way too much to be concerned with. Again, very intriguing. <laughs> so we're not doing too badly, really. We're three quarters of the way through. Got a few more to go. And this is my little category called broader questions. This one from That's One Slimy Toad goes... I was wondering if you've ever planned to have Abe meet any more of the critters Stranger uses as ammunition, like the fuzzles. Will we ever see Abe using the stunks to make Sligs puke or blowing one up with a boom bat? I think we've just touched on the surface of what the possibilities of live ammo are. And we've had different things on the drawing table at different times. And we were really hoping for an appearance of Stranger in Soulstorm. And, uh, he was going to leave Abe some things. <laughs> and then, you know, it just became one of those side plots that was lost to the cutting room floor. But I love the idea of making a shooter with a twist, right? And I'm curious if people have played recently, the uh, creator of uh, Rick and Morty created a game. And I know they were fans of ours. So I'm really curious to see, because uh, I've met him a few times, big gamer. I'm really curious to see uh, how the game goes over, but it has this really unique like live weapon system. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's being compared to Oddworld, but I just, you know, encourage creativity across the board. So I'm curious if people have played that or if it's even out yet. Sorry, I'm so busy on things. I haven't been keeping up to date on everything. But I think there's so much potential there, you know, for live ammo. And also, I just love the idea that a shooter has found another way to use small critters on another level. And that made building Stranger very tough, I just might add, because every ammo piece, like normally a bullet or a bomb, it goes off, it has a fancy effect, it does some damage. But um, it usually doesn't become a living thing. So it was a lot of fun using the idea that animals and different behavior, you could uh, fire from a bow and have a character that's the central figure in a shooter who wasn't shooting in the traditional ways. But it did make development a lot more complicated because, like I said, every piece of ammo needed its own AI. Mm, yes. So quite a lot of AI then. Yeah. In the Discord, Discord, if you fancy filling us in on the Rick and Morty game and having some chats about that, I'm sure that will lead in some very interesting directions as well. Yeah, I forget what it's called, but I'm sure the fans will figure it out. Oh, apparently it's called High on Life. <laughs> and it's not out yet. So you're more ahead of the curve than you realized. <laughs> okay. Well, finally. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm still waiting for that to happen. Um, right. Next question from Goofasaur. Nice. I like that too. It goes, Hi, Lorne. For years, I've loved the designs of many of Oddworld's various fauna, such as the paramites, scrabs, and slogs. I'm very curious to learn what inspired some of their designs, as well as why so many creatures seem to lack eyes. Is there a law or reason behind it, or is it more to make them look as gnarly as possible? You know, on some levels here, I'd have to be speaking for the original designer of those, which was Stephen Olds. He was just so awesome. But he was always after something that hadn't been done before. And he was always after kind of trying to push the limits of the strange, you know, just really designing unique signatures for, I'd say, semi-simple creatures that would just have a, a distinctive behavior and look to them. And I really wanted to give Steve the latitude, uh, you know, because he was there right at the beginning of the company. 
And I wanted to give them the latitude to really take the cuffs off, so to speak, of uh, a lot of the more commercial things we were doing as a service, you know, in the film business. And I thought he was just brilliant on a lot of levels. So I just kind of let him run. And we had some basic ideas. And then out of those later designers and stuff was like, hey, we can layer on this behavior or we can do that. Or how do they know you're coming when they don't have eyes? You know, and they would be like, okay, they could feel your footsteps. Like we were going through a lot of things because we just liked the designs, you know? So in some ways, that's not the most clever approach for game design. You know, I'd say like Miyamoto nailed that where if it hurts to jump on it, it's going to have spikes on its head. If it's going to, you know, it had a visual language for everything it did. And when we got into more, I'd say, uh, less cartoony types of characters, you know, we always used to say it needs to look like it came from mother, you know, that it had an actual DNA heritage. It, it, it was a little more challenging to be like, okay, where are they dangerous from what end? You know, it was easier for a paramount to scrap. But uh, for other creatures, it would be for the slogs, it became more complicated because they didn't have eyes, you know. So it's possible that we'd see some variations of those later that do have eyes. But I was I was facilitating Steve to just to just create more strange, more different. And so he had a lot of latitude to do that. And for whatever reason, he didn't put a lot of eyes in his characters uh. that were uh, that were wild. So it sort of just evolved kind of naturally. I guess so. Yeah. 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 Because Steve would sort of set an inspirational point. And if you've looked at the original drawings, I mean, it's just, he was so good. And this is back, you know, on pencil, right? For example, of Steve Olds, the first Photoshop painting he made was the map painting used for Rupture Farms in Abe's Odyssey. And it was really like, it wasn't easy getting him to go digital. You know, I was like, Steve, you just, you know, he's like, yeah, the paint system still suck. You know, <laughs> we're still in the 90s, right? And he saw what we went through with him when we were building the, the big uh, film resolution paint system before Photoshop was available. And he was like, yeah, it just doesn't feel right. And he was extraordinary with a pencil. He was so exceptional in a lot of ways. He was granted that latitude. And then the rest of us would try and figure out ways that we could make what he was creating behave more cool. Uh-huh. So it's a bit of the inverse of what you should do. <laughs> you, know, you know, but uh, a fascinating little insight. Well, thanks. But what you should do is you should know this is exactly what we want the character to do. Now, how should it look? Instead, we were like, this guy's really cool. Let's figure out how we should do things, you know, which is um, can be problematic for game design for sure. So I, I caution against that. It really underlines the idea that there's no really right or wrong way of, of doing these things. It's whatever works. Sometimes a limitation can be a strength and vice versa, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. But if you're game builders, I think you have to, uh, it's most prudent to work back from what you know you need the functional design to be. Right. Right. It's easier to get yourself in trouble if you're just inspired by a design and you're trying to figure out how it might work. For game design, say, you know, it's, it's, uh, it could be really dangerous. Very interesting. Thank you for that answer. I feel compelled to go on and say one or two more things, but I'm watching the clock and I'm going to pop along to the next question. Okay. Um, which I think is a, a lovely question. It's from Kaltar and it goes, Hi, Lorne. Thank you for you and for Oddworld Inhabitants creation. Oddworld has been a rock through some tough times in my life. My question regarding the wildlife of Oddworld is... Do you have an idea in your head of what the real world equivalent of paramite pies and scrab cakes taste would be? And is wildlife used in any other industrialist products like the power up drinks or the dreaded butt flow from <laughs> Vikers Labs? <laughs> but, butt flow was, uh, I, lo I love the question. Butt flow was um, someone had to have a, uh, what do they call it? A colon. A coloscopy, a, colo a colonoscopy, a colonoscopy. Yes. <laughs> and they had to drink this. They were working at the company and they had to drink this stuff. And then they had to work from home for like three days because they were like, man, there's nowhere I can go without needing to do an emergency bathroom run. So we let them work from home <laughs> before people were working from home. But it was that bad. And we were like, you need butt flow. Like, <laughs> make that easy. So that was like, you know, the jokes that were coming out for those types of products and the team was having fun with those things. But when I look at it, I go, okay, gator is eaten in a lot of places in the world, but it's really oily. 
like they say, it's really greasy. It's kind of, people don't like it. Or I should say certain people don't like it. But if you go to the bayou, you know, or you go to Africa, crocodile, you know, people are certainly eating that meat. Then they just figure out different ways to cook it to make it more palatable. So I would always thought that scraps would taste a little more like gator, kind of a greasy meat. And then paramites, we fell back into the, how many things taste like chicken? <laughs> like, <laughs> like here, you know, there's a lot of rattlesnakes where we live now. And people are like, you ever eaten it yet? And I was like, no. And they go, tastes like chicken. <laughs> there's a lot of things people go, tastes like chicken. Pigeon, tastes like chicken. I just always thought that the paramites would taste more like chicken, even though they didn't have feathers. And, <laughs> and that's about as far as that's gone. Okay, and then for the the uh, industrialized products, that would be uh, absolutely, meaning nothing should go to waste. And I can tell you this, if you knew, I almost hesitate to say it, but if you knew what was in fertilizer these days, like how much of humans is being recycled for products that we're unaware of. A member of our team had a bone graft recently. And when Sherry had one like 20 years ago, because she had some dental surgery was needed, she needed to do a bone graft, they cut it out of her hip. That's an intense operation. You know, people take a long time to typically recover from that. So they'd go in and they cut out some of your bones and then they kind of mash it up and then they use it to sort of begin the growing of new bones somewhere else. And they do that all the time for uh, accident victims, et cetera. In the case of um, someone on our team just had a, a, was going through dental surgery right now and they were using a new type of bone graft, which actually comes from cadavers. Right. So if you look at what medical products right now have human remains in them, what food products or what fertilizer products have human remains, we don't waste much. And I don't say that proudly, but a favorite thing I hear a lot from the investment community, which is like, we don't need to know how the sausage is made. We just need to know it's going to be good sausage. <laughs> right. First for this person question, I appreciate that Oddworld's had that effect in your life. And uh, that means a lot to us. And I believe that's the power of media, you know, what we can do with it. But yeah, when it comes to where does everything go, everything has another market, just like the real world. Like, for instance, not to belabor it, but just to go here. With petrochemical manufacturing came all kinds of toxicities. But then they just figured out, no, 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 it's not toxic, because then we got to do expensive removal and you know, has this waste. It's it's just a product for a different application, right? So you go, in the history of what's been identified as product, there are entire marketing and lobby room firms, et cetera, that are geared around finding secondary markets. So it's no longer considered just toxic waste. It's really an ingredient to something else that's new, right? And uh, without getting into specifics, that goes on all the time. So toxic waste became a new revenue stream. You know, if you can think of that, it winds up back in your food all over the place. Fabulous answer. Thank you, Lorne. You bet. I think uh, this is going to lead quite nicely into this question, which could potentially be very far ranging. But I like how uh, open ended it is. This is from Oxide. Can you please confirm to the fans exactly what some of these creatures taste like? <laughs> and I suppose we've already started with a few. <laughs> yeah, go, you know, it tastes like chicken is, is the most common. <laughs> and then it's. And then it's, so this was just, just a really interesting thing that happened to me because I knew um, a, a lot of pretty serious outdoors people in my life. And some of them were hunters, or fish, fishermen, hunters, et cetera. And um, some people would say, you know, venison is just really tough. You know, it's really tough. And you talk to other people, they go, I was, I was with a guy one time in his house and he goes, I take one deer a year. Uh, that's what the permit allots me. This is, a, would you like to have some venison? I was like, eh, you know, not really. I like my meat really tender. He goes, what are you talking about, man? He goes, let me show you something. And so he cooked me up some really fast, just salt, salt and pepper and a little oil in a skillet pan. And it was unbelievably awesome. And I do like meat. <laughs> so that's, that's hard to remove from my diet. I was like, how did you do this? He goes, it's all in how it's bled. You know, so without getting into the tactics, but if it's bled correctly immediately, the, it tastes totally different than if it wasn't done with the right knowledge. And so where I grew up, everyone was like, deer tastes kind of terrible. It was because most people didn't know how to clean it. Like immediately after killing it, they didn't know how to deal with it properly. And that severely changed the taste. So that's kind of a long-winded way of getting back to, I think there's greasy meats like bison 
if you ever had a bison burger, it's way better than a hamburger. It's just more tender. You know, it's more great tasting. There are large farms of it now. Free range bison stuff's a big thing. Everything can be seasoned into something digestible. Right? Just go through like a uh, Bangkok food bazaar area and see all the things that people are eating. The scorpions, the spiders, the, the bugs, the, you know, and they love them. <laughs> like in some cases, they're delicacies. Yes. World cuisine has some very uh, unusual examples of that. <laughs> yeah, I've got some books on world cuisine and some of it's terrifying. I have no idea what they taste like. That's interesting what you say about the, the bison farms. I'd be very interested in trying one of those. I'm sure they're lovely. Right. So we've got through all of the questions. Save one. This last one I say for last because it's just a tiddly bit different from the others. So this is from Shade Meadows. Um, of all these animals, which species is the most intelligent one? Of the ones we've seen so far, it would be the gabbit. Because the gabbits were still largely just considered wildlife. You know, Munch was the sole remainder. And so they would be those of the wildlife that had the highest intelligence, like dolphins. I was thinking of them as dolphins that could hop. If that <laughs> makes sense, you know, it doesn't make sense on a lot of levels. But if you think about dolphins, you know, it kind of does very empathetic, you know, very capable of terrible things, but capable of amazing things. Lots of cases of dolphins rescuing people, things like that. Wolves have done it, too. Indeed. And some of the other higher mammalian predators like uh, killer whales who inexplicably rescue people, but also are some of the most vicious, sadistic hunters in other ways. Yeah. Yeah. It's all, it's almost like the intelligence can display itself in either way. Yeah. I've heard horrible things about killer whales and then some amazing things. Okay. You were able to give a more direct answer on that than I was suspecting. So, <laughs> so we're thinking gabbits for that one. Excellent. That we've seen so far, for sure. Well, that we've seen so far, of course. Right. So time to wrap up. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much, Lorne. It's been a true pleasure. Um, really honestly fascinating answers to some really great questions. And thank you to the community for asking those questions. If we didn't get the chance to fit in your questions today, have no fear. There's a very good chance we'll be able to include it in future episodes. For our next podcast, that's episode six, the topic will be creating a protagonist, Abe the Unlikely Hero. So, Hop onto the Oddworld Inhabitants Discord server to submit your questions for Lorne on the subject of protagonists. So I'm guessing this will deal a lot with Abe and probably Alf and Toby too. Sounds like a topic for lively discussion, wouldn't you say, Lorne? Absolutely. This episode will be in about a month. Check the Discord for upcoming details on that, including exact dates and times. Today's live show will be edited into a podcast, and uh, that will be very soon, and will be available for your listening pleasure at the following address, anchor.fm forward slash Oddworld Inc. We'll share all the links on the Discord. As always, we appreciate your patience while the edit is being processed. Um, one thing that I didn't mention earlier is that I've had the personal pleasure of editing the last three of the podcasts, and I've enjoyed every moment of it, and I'm looking forward to doing this one as well. Um, on that note, for all those listening to the podcast, hello. Um, if you'd care to listen live to future Discord chat episodes, you can do so by joining the official Oddworld Inhabitants Discord, and the address is discord.gg forward slash oddworld. And we'll be sharing some clips on our socials too. So that's all from this episode. Thank you for joining me, Tony, your stand-in host. I hope I fill Dan's ample shoes today. And of course, a big, huge, colossal thank you to Lorne himself. Thank you, Lorne. Well, thank you. And I think you did great, Tony. So I re really appreciate you standing there for Dan today. Well, and it was my pleasure. And thank you, Dan, for asking me. So we'll see everybody, all of you, next time. And uh, goodbye from me. Goodbye. And goodbye from Lorne. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye now. Bye.